So I'm going to kick off by talking about uh, the immune system and how it works, and then some different aspects of the interaction of nutrition and nutritional state with immunity and how that might influence risk and severity of infectious disease, particularly viral infections. Uh, just to start, this is uh, my disclosures. So I'm, as I say, I'm going to start by saying something about the immune system, just to get everybody up to speed. Talk briefly about why different people have different immune competence, sources of variation in immunity. Then I'll mention the impact of uh, obesity on immunity and uh, uh, susceptibility to infectious disease. Make some points about nutrition in general, and then say something about three different micronutrients that I think are very interesting in the context of immunity, and then I'll summarize at the end. So the immune system is the way we protect ourselves from invading pathogens, things like bacteria, viruses, and so on. The immune system is composed of cells, but the off, these often aggregate together in tissues like the spleen, lymph nodes, uh, uh, discrete pockets in the gut wall, and so on. But essentially, the immune system is our defense system. And we know that a well-functioning immune system provides good defense against pathogenic organisms. And we know that with certainty because people who have immunosuppression or who are immunocompromised are at much greater risk of infections out of infections becoming severe, even fatal. The four general functional features of the immune system are listed here. So firstly, it presents an exclusion barrier to keep pathogens out. So you could think of the skin, the uh, mucosal linings of the gastrointestinal and respiratory tracts, and the acid pH of the stomach as being components of the exclusion barrier. Secondly, and really importantly, the immune system recognizes and identifies organisms if they break through the exclusion barrier. And this recognition is key to how the immune system protects us. Thirdly, it acts to eliminate those organisms that it recognizes as being harmful. So it, it actually destroys those organisms. It kills bacteria, it kills virally infected cells, so viruses have nowhere to replicate. Finally, the immune system has a memory component. So this is immunological memory. So your immune system can remember many of the encounters it's had before. And what that means, if a person is reinfected, the response is faster and more vigorous than it was the first time. And this memory component of the immune system is the basis of vaccination, which is very topical right now. So the immune system is pretty sophisticated with these recognition, elimination, and memory functions. And this high level of sophistication is uh, brought about because of the many different components of the immune response. These are typically divided into innate or natural immunity and acquired or adaptive immunity. Innate immunity includes the barrier functions, but also some cellular functions like natural killer cells and other innate cells, and it includes the inflammatory response and the function of phagocytic cells, which engulf and destroy microorganisms. Acquired immunity includes the function of different T lymphocytes, and there are many different types of T cell and B lymphocytes. Each of the different cells involved in the immune response has its own specific function. For example, B lymphocytes are the cells that produce antibodies. T lymphocytes are the controllers, and phagocytes carry out this process of engulfing microorganisms, for example. Some T cells, like cytotoxic T cells, and also natural killer cells, they can kill virally infected cells and also tumor cells. So what we see is different cellular components that each have their own individual roles in the immune response. But all of these different cell types have to communicate with one another and interact to make an effective response to a particular organism. And I capture that in this figure from a review I published last year with regard to antiviral immunity. The detail of this doesn't matter, but what you see is the many different cell types are interacting with one another, ultimately aiming to defend us against invading viruses. So we see the, uh, the communication between phagocytes, T cells, B cells, the production of antibodies, direct attack on virally infected cells by some immune cell types. So there's lots of interaction, there's lots of communication, and there has to be coordination. So again, just to summarize, the immune system presents a barrier to keep pathogens out, but it contains these really sophisticated 
cellular components of both innate and acquired immunity that come into play if the barrier is weakened or if these organisms uh, break through the barrier. Of course, in the last 14 months, weak immune systems have been exposed as a major public health challenge, at least in parts of the world where there was less concern uh, at the current time about infectious disease, as Jeff alluded to. So we've seen significant uh, um, illness, significant mortality as a result of the presence in our, vir in our environment of a new uh, virus, which of course is, is highly, uh, highly virulent. Now we know uh, some people show um, severe COVID-19, some people die as a result of that, but in fact, probably most people who are infected show very mild symptoms. In fact, many will be asymptomatic. So some people are coping quite well with the presence of coronavirus, others are not. Why is that? Well, maybe it's because they have different levels of immunity, if you like, different uh, uh, immune competency. So here I show some of the many factors that can influence the immune response. And of course, these factors will vary between people. So there are some clear, obvious things like genetics will determine the immune response, infection and infection history, vaccination, some illnesses, some medications, things like cigarette smoking and alcohol consumption, they can impair the immune response. Stress, physical, physiological and psychological stress also impair immunity. But the immune response also changes with the life course. So you're gonna hear later on about the immune decline that happens as people age, so-called immunosenescence. Physically fit people have stronger immune systems than unfit people. As I'm going to show you, body fatness impacts on immunity, frailty impacts on immunity. So overweight people and also people with frailty have impaired immunity. I'm going to talk about the influence of some of diet in general and some specific nutrients that support the immune response. And the gut microbiota, which again, you're gonna hear a little bit about later on, is also important in regulating the immune response. So there are many different factors involved that affect the immune response. And um, therefore it's unsurprising that some people in the population have stronger immunity than others. So I'm going to start by talking about the effect of body fatness. <clears throat> and I'm going to start right in with COVID-19, because relatively early on in the pandemic, it was noticed that there seemed to be a disproportionate number of people with obesity who were hospitalized with COVID-19 and who were displaying severe COVID-19 symptoms. <clears throat> so this is data from one of the first studies. These are French, uh, French authors. Uh, where they simply related body mass index from normal weight to BMI more than 35 to the need for mechanical ventilation in patients who were already in the ICU with COVID-19. So these were all sick patients, but some of them required extra uh, respiratory support. And what the authors identified was it's sort of a dose response relationship, if you like, between body mass index and the need for ventilation. So in other words, the disease was more severe, the higher the body mass index. Now, this may not be a surprise if you know about the literature on obesity and immunity, because it's well, very well described that obesity impairs the activity of many cells of the immune system, including cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells that are involved in antiviral immunity. Obesity reduces antibody responses and reduces the production of an important antiviral cytokine interferon gamma. It was already known that people with obesity are more susceptible to infections and they don't respond so well to some vaccinations, including the seasonal flu vaccination compared with normal weight people. In the influenza pandemic of about 10 years ago, people with obesity showed poor antiviral responses and recovered poorly from disease compared to normal weight people. Also, even when obese people are vaccinated with the seasonal flu vaccine, they have a higher risk of developing influenza compared to normal weight people. So the immune system is weak in people with obesity. This predisposes to poor vaccination responses and predisposes to infection. Paradoxically, obesity is associated 
with low-grade inflammation. So this is a real imbalance in the immune system, not enough immunity, too much inflammation. Now, this is a really interesting study where um, American researchers, this is Melinda Beck's group, took cells from healthy weight people or normal weight people, overweight people and people with obesity, and they incubated those cells in a test tube with the influenza vaccine. So they were looking at the ability of cells from people of different body mass index to respond to vaccination in a test tube. And the outcomes were activation of cytotoxic T cells, important in antiviral immunity, the production of this protein, which is one of the proteins that helps the immune system kill virally infected cells, and the production of interferon gamma. And you see that the response was always weaker if the cells came from people with obesity compared to if the cells came from people of normal weight. And cells from overweight people were somewhere in between. So the immune cells of people with obesity have poor responses. Let's move on to talk about specific nutrients. So people often struggle with the idea that nutrition can be important in supporting the immune system. So here are the seven reasons for nutrition being vital for the immune system to function. Firstly, the immune system has a high demand for energy. And of course, the fuels required for energy generation come from the macronutrients that we eat. Secondly, the immune system is highly biosynthetic. I mentioned the production of antibodies, cytokines. Also, there's huge cellular proliferation. So there's lots of biosynthesis going on. And of course, the building blocks for this biosynthesis come from things that we eat. Some nutrients are very important regulators of the molecular and cellular aspects of the immune response. Zinc, vitamin A, vitamin D would be good examples of that. Some nutrients are substrates for chemicals involved in immunity. For example, the amino acid arginine is the substrate for nitric oxide production and nitric oxide kills <coughs> bacteria. As I'll show you uh, shortly, some nutrients have specific anti-infection roles. Again, zinc and vitamin D would be good examples of that, and vitamin A, and maybe selenium as well. Part of the uh, immune response involves inflammation, and the aim of inflammation is to create a hostile environment for pathogens. That environment is also dangerous to our own cells, so we have to be protected from the oxidative stress and the inflammatory stress that the immune response imposes, and many antioxidant vitamins, minerals, other nutrients might be important there. And then finally, as I mentioned already, and as you'll hear later on, the microbiota is really important in supporting the immune response. And of course, our diet controls our microbiota. So one way to think about this is nutrient supply uh, influences nutrient status in nutrient stores, and that influences immune function. And in turn, yeah. immune function determines our ability to defend against pathogens. So if we have an inadequate nutrient supply, too little uh, 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 energy, too little protein and energy, uh, micronutrient deficiencies, we have inadequate status in stores, we have impaired immunity, and we have impaired ability to defend against pathogens. That means we have more infections, more severe infections, infectious illness, and death. So people have been interested in which nutrients are really important in supporting the immune response. And, you know, researchers have been looking at this for decades now. Now, it's been identified, in fact, that there are multiple nutrients that are really vital for the immune system to function optimally. This includes fat-soluble vitamins, particularly A, D, and E, uh, water-soluble vitamins, all of the B vitamins, vitamin C, many minerals, including zinc, copper, selenium, and iron, um, essential and other amino acids, essential and other fatty acids, and also, um, you know, some of the polyphenolic compounds from plants all seem to have important roles. If you're interested in micronutrients, about a year ago, this review on micronutrients, immunity infection, a uh, very comprehensive review was published in Nutrients. And this is a figure from that review, which hopefully you can see. So what the authors have got is the barrier function here. They've got inna um, the innate um, cellular components of the innate immune response here the inflammatory response, antigen presentation, 
T cell mediated immunity and B cell mediated immunity. And then these darker circles are the nutrients, the micronutrients that are really important for supporting that component of immunity. So within any of these circles, you see multiple micronutrients listed. So for T cell mediated immunity, we see vitamins A, D, C, E, B6, B12, folate. We see zinc, uh, iron, copper, and selenium. So multiple micronutrients are important for all these aspects of immunity. And in fact, the same micronutrients are listed in multiple boxes. So multiple micronutrients have multiple roles in supporting the immune response. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about three of these in the context of COVID-19, vitamin D, zinc, and selenium. So first of all, vitamin D has many roles in the immune system. Immune cells have the vitamin D receptor, so that means they can respond to vitamin D. And interestingly, some cells of the immune system, including macrophages and dendritic cells, produce the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Normally, we think of that being produced by the kidney. That's the sort of the classic pathway of synthesis of the active form of vitamin D. But in fact, as I say, dendritic cells and macrophages also produce the active form. And I think the fact that the immune system produces the active form of vitamin D tells me that vitamin D must be very important to immunity. Vitamin D plays roles in controlling the function of antigen-presenting cells, T cells and B cells. It also promotes the release of antibacterial proteins like catholicidin, beta defensins, and overall it has important roles in both antibacterial and antiviral defenses. This is a meta-analysis of the effect of vitamin D deficiency on the response to seasonal flu vaccination. The seasonal flu vaccine includes three different strains of the flu virus, the H1N1, the H3N2, and the B strain. So you can measure in a person's blood antibodies to each of these three viral strains after a person has been vaccinated. And what the meta-analysis shows is that vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency impairs the response to the B strain and the H3N2 strain of the flu virus. So vitamin D deficiency impairs the vaccination response, so it impairs the immune response. That would relate to or translate into increased susceptibility to infection with low vitamin D status. So these are data from over 7,000 uh, middle-aged British adults who gave blood in different parts of the year. Vitamin D was measured, that's the gray histogram on the left here. And so you see vitamin D levels are highest in summer, lowest in winter. And respiratory tract infections were monitored in those same individuals across the year. Respiratory tract infections are high in winter, low in summer. So this is an inverse association between vitamin D status and respiratory infections. Now on the right, is if you look within any season, winter, spring, summer, autumn, and you look at the effect of vitamin D status within a season on respiratory infection. And whether it's winter, spring, summer, or autumn, those individuals with highest vitamin D status always have the lowest risk of respiratory infection. Of course, this is just an association. It doesn't show cause and effect. Cause and effect would come from randomized controlled trials giving people vitamin D. In fact, quite a number of those trials have been done, vitamin D versus placebo, looking at respiratory tract infection. So this is a meta-analysis published in British Medical Journal in 2017 of 25 trials in 11,000 adults and children giving vitamin D with different dosing regimens and different doses and obviously different durations and then reporting on respiratory tract infections. And what the researchers found was that those individuals given vitamin D had a lower risk of respiratory tract infections than those individuals given uh, placebo. So in other words, vitamin D prevents uh, uh, some, lowers the risk of respiratory tract infections. Yeah. In subgroup analysis, they noted that patients who were vitamin D deficient gained most from vitamin D supplementation, which of course makes sense. So people have been quite interested in vitamin D in the context of COVID-19. 
And there are dozens of papers associating low vitamin D status with incidence of COVID-19 and severity of COVID-19. Of course, again, these are just associations. They have been subject to systematic reviews and to meta-analyses. So this is one of the systematic reviews that identified that uh, studies showed that blood vitamin D status determines the risk of infection with COVID-19, seriousness of COVID-19, and mortality from COVID-19. This is a meta-analysis looking at vitamin D deficiency, showing that vitamin D deficiency increases the risk of severe COVID-19 compared to vitamin D sufficiency. Vitamin D deficiency increases the risk of hospitalization with COVID-19, and vitamin D deficiency increases the risk of death uh, from COVID-19. Again, all from association studies, but quite convincing data. There are some randomized controlled trials of different uh, um, uh, uh, robustness looking at giving people vitamin D or not and outcomes from COVID-19. Often these have been done in people once they reach hospital with COVID-19, giving them normal care with and without usually uh, high doses of vitamin D over the first few days of hospitalization. In fact, these trials have already been subject to meta-analysis. And this is the effect of vitamin D supplementation on length of ICU stay. And you see vitamin D supplementation reduced length of ICU stay by about 90% uh, in the meta-analysis of these three studies. So vitamin D supplementation in people hospitalized with COVID-19 seems to improve outcome. Let's look at zinc now. Zinc also supports the function of many different cell types, contributes to antioxidant protection, reduces inflammation, and as I'll show you in the next slides, it has very specific antiviral actions. Supplementation studies with zinc, some older studies, some newer studies, show that giving people with low zinc status or low zinc intakes, these are usually older people uh, in these trials, uh, giving them supplemental zinc has been demonstrated to increase, uh, to improve some immune biomarkers like T cell uh, function, for example. There are also some studies showing zinc improves response to vaccination. And there are quite a few trials looking at the ability of zinc to uh, treat uh, infectious illness, both diarrheal and respiratory infections. And indeed, there are meta-analyses showing that zinc can uh, be used to treat uh, severe pneumonia. So zinc seems to be important in supporting the immune system, preventing viral infection, uh, and maybe even treating viral infection. Now, one of the intriguing things about zinc is it has specific antiviral actions. So this is um, coronavirus. The genome of coronavirus is single-stranded RNA. For the virus to replicate, it has to produce another copy a new copy of its genome. It has to produce viral protein, and then the virus subunits are, um, are assembled. Now, the first step in both the RNA synthetic pathway and the protein synthetic pathway is catalyzed by this enzyme, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And it turns out that zinc is an inhibitor of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So zinc may have a specific role in preventing replication of coronavirus. Now, this is nicely shown in this paper from 11 years ago by Dutch researchers, where they did cell culture studies looking at the effect of zinc on coronavirus replication. So they infected epithelial cells. And remember, coronavirus infects respiratory epithelial cells amongst other cells. They infected epithelial cells in a laboratory with uh, coronavirus. And then these are the different coronavirus RNAs that are produced. And then they added to the culture medium, increasing concentrations of zinc. And you see, as the concentration increases, so the amount of viral RNA decreases. So um, of course, this wasn't the only experiment they did, but their experiment showed quite clearly that zinc can prevent coronavirus replication. <clears throat> Now, the concentration of zinc in the bloodstream is around about here. 
So this is, um, we may be able to get additional uh, antiviral effects by raising uh, uh, the concentration of zinc in the bloodstream or in interstitial fluids. Now, just coincidentally, about 18 months ago, there was this really nice review on zinc and antiviral immunity and advances of nutrition that talks about the different uh, parts of, uh, of uh, viral biology that zinc interferes with. So that's pretty interesting. Now, again, people have been interested in zinc and COVID, of course. Um, so these are the sorts of studies that have been produced so far. Um, this is a study looking at zinc status in healthy controls and people hospitalized with COVID-19. People hospitalized with COVID-19 have lower zinc status than healthy controls. Those who are discharged from hospital had better zinc status than those who died as a result of COVID-19. Another study showing lower zinc status in patients with COVID-19 compared to healthy controls. And another one showing zinc is, zinc is lower with severe COVID-19 compared to mild or moderate COVID-19. And then this is a receiver operator characteristics plot where the authors identified that low zinc was a very uh, uh, highly sensitive um, uh, and specific marker or predictor of critical illness in COVID-19. There are a couple of randomized controlled trials of zinc in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 showing that zinc can improve outcomes and reduce mortality. The last nutrient to talk about is selenium, which I think is much overlooked. So selenium supports the function of many cell types, contributes to antioxidant protection, reduces inflammation. Um, it improves immune biomarkers, at least in some studies, uh, and it has been used in various viral infections with some uh, benefits. Now, there's been quite a lot of research on selenium deficiency in mice, and these studies show that selenium deficiency impairs the immune response, increases susceptibility to viral infection. Selenium deficiency allows viruses to mutate, including the flu virus, and it allows normally weak viruses to become more virulent. And I think this is really interesting in the context of the uh, emergence of coronavirus variants whether these emerge because some people have a, have a nutritional environment, a uh, physiological nutritional environment that permits viral mutation. I think that's an interesting question. Now, for me, the key study of selenium and immunity is this study carried out in Liverpool, uh, published in 2004. So this is a study in, um, in adults with low selenium status who were put into a randomized controlled trial and they received placebo 50 or 100 micrograms of selenium per day for a period of time. And then they were given the oral poliovirus vaccine. So the poliovirus vaccine given orally, it's not injected, and it's a live poliovirus. It's live but attenuated. So it's still alive, but it's not uh, dangerous. Then they took blood from these people and they stimulated the blood in the test tube with the poliovirus. <clears throat> So before vaccination, this is interferon gamma production, before vaccination, the cells from these people don't respond to poliovirus. Post-vaccination, they do, they produce interferon gamma. So this is interferon gamma at 7, 14, 21 days in the placebo group in the dark bars. But you see interferon gamma production is increased at 50 micrograms of selenium per day, and it's increased even more at 100 micrograms of selenium per day. So giving selenium seems to improve T-cell responses and interferon gamma production in response to poliovirus exposure. Now, because the poliovirus is alive um, and is given orally, um, if it's not eliminated from the body, if it's not destroyed, uh, if it's not contained, uh, the virus appears in the feces. So this is the number of people, 20 per group, who had poliovirus in their feces at one, two, and three weeks post-vaccination. So in the control group, even three weeks post-vaccination, 14 out of 20 individuals had poliovirus in their feces. This was lower. It was nine in the 50 micrograms per selenium of selenium per day, and even lower, seven out of 20 at 100 micrograms of selenium per day. So selenium results in better viral clearance. The other thing these researchers looked at was mutant viral sequences in the feces. 
So on the left of the bottom panel, these are fecal samples from the controls, 50 micrograms of selenium in the middle, and 100 micrograms of selenium on the right-hand side. This is the normal poliovirus uh, sequences here. In the control group, you see the emergence of these mutant sequences. So even over the course of um, a few days to weeks, the polio virus is mutating in the individuals in the control group. This seems to be less at 50 micrograms of selenium per day, and it seems to be almost absent at 100 micrograms of selenium per day. So giving supplemental selenium prevents viral mutations in humans. Or to put it the other way around, selenium deficiency permits viral mutations to occur in humans, just as it does in mice. So again, people have been interested in selenium status in COVID-19. Again, these are data showing selenium status is lower in people hospitalized with COVID-19 compared to healthy controls. It's higher in those who are discharged compared to those who died. So to summarize, what I've told you is the immune system is central to protection against infection. It's highly complicated, it's highly sophisticated. I mentioned that obesity is associated with impaired immunity, so is frailty. So undernutrition and overnutrition both impair immunity. I've talked about the role of specific nutrients and particular vitamins and minerals that have important roles in supporting the immune system. I've told you that low intakes and status of these nutrients impairs the immune response and makes people more susceptible to infections, including viral infections, and this situation can be prevented or reversed by repletion. Zinc, and maybe vitamin D as well, has special roles in antiviral immunity, and I think this effect of selenium, which no one is really talking about very much, is really intriguing. So I think to really wrap it up, nutrition has a key role in dealing with pathogens, both bacteria and viruses, and in preventing infection becoming more severe, and micronutrients are really vital for this. Thanks very much for your attention.